Thank you, Michael. Good morning. You guys sound so great. Most of you had your coffee. Some of you are getting your tea. That is wonderful. I don't drink coffee, but I did have my tea. So um, I'm Latonia Naylor, as Michael said, the manager of community impact from the United Way of Pioneer Valley, which is all the way across the street. And so <laughs> I rushed over here because I wanted to be on time. Um, however, uh, bring your greetings from the United Way. And I've been doing volunteer engagement now for almost four years at the United Way. And as Michael stated, very much looking at volunteer programming as well as capacity building for organizations around community engagement and volunteer engagement. And good morning. I'm Lindsay Bennett Jacobs. I'm going to have to get used to hearing myself in one ear. Um, and I'm the director of RSVP of Hampshire and Franklin counties. RSVP is the Retired and Senior Volunteer Program. I always say you don't have to be retired or a senior, you just have to be 55 or older. Because uh, I know a lot of folks in that age range are, would not consider themselves seniors or are not necessarily retired or semi-retired. Um, so we have about 600 plus volunteers in Hampshire and Franklin counties uh, serving in about 55 different organizations. Some of you may have advertised your opportunities in my newsletter, um, and I hope that those of you in Hampshire and Franklin County will connect with me afterward so I can be of more help to you on this topic. Um, all right, so we want to get a sense of who's in the room. Latonia and I are really interested in the fact that not too many people had volunteer in their titles who are attending today. So we think that's great. Um, that means that you may or may not have a lot of volunteer management experience training. So I really want to get a sense in the room of if that's something you know a lot about, if you feel like you're pretty knowledgeable about volunteer management. Anybody? Pretty knowledgeable? Great. So we got about half. And newer to the volunteer management scene? Um, okay, great. So we'll try to speak to everybody and hopefully some of the more experienced folks can offer some advice. The other thing we want to get a sense about um, is what sort of organizations you're representing. If you are an organization with a small staff, who has a small staff? Okay, more than half probably. And a larger staff, bigger organization? Okay, great. Um, do you have an established volunteer program? It's been going for a while. A few folks. And do you have a new volunteer program or you're looking to start using volunteers more? Great, okay. So kind of look around at, at your peers and we may connect you with each other as we go along. Um, and there might be a few organizations that are more volunteers than staff. Is that true of anybody? All right, yep. And other folks who have more staff than volunteers. Okay, so we've got a really good mix in the room. Nice. I like nice. that. Great. I like it. Yeah, any other questions before I? No. Lead them through? Okay. Yes. Great. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the focus of the session. And when we first put our notes together and talked about this, Michael said, well, that sounds great, but it sounds like a lot of volunteering 101. We said, well, yes, because if you're doing all the basics right, then this is going to be a really easy process. If you're not doing all the basics right, you're really going to struggle. So we want to make sure that everybody has a good grasp on some of those key things that you need to do. Because when Latonia and I compare notes, we hear a lot of the same things. Right. And we want to make sure that you, don't avoid, you can avoid those pitfalls. Um, so things like, well, I called this place that I was really excited about volunteering, and I talked to somebody, but then they never followed up. We hear that a lot. Right. Um, more than we'd like. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you say? Yes. So we wanted to make sure that, that some of those things are going to be things that you can avoid by planning in a way that really makes sense with what you already have in place or what you're hoping to put in place. So it may be that you start very small right now, and that's fine, but we'd rather you do it really well and start small than go really big and then have people say, well, I tried to volunteer for this place, but mm, it wasn't great. We live in a small community. People talk about organizations. We want the talk to be all positive for you. Right. It's very important. Um, so we really believe that volunteering and working with volunteers is a building a relationship. You should be thinking about, you know, just as you build relationships with the staff you see all the time, volunteers are going to be operating the same way. Except with volunteers, they don't have that monetary incentive already. So you need to think about how else do I appreciate these folks and, and build my relationship with them so they know that they're a valued member of the team, that we really appreciate what they're bringing um, to the table and to the group so that they then want to return. 
Um, and the other thing that it does when you really spend time making sure that volunteers are in the right spot, that they know that you value them, that they're doing something that matters to the organization, is that you build a long-term relationship with those volunteers. And so maybe they come once a year for your big event, but they love it and they talk it up amongst mm -hmm. their friends and family members and other volunteers. Um, and it's a lot less work to engage three people at the beginning of the year and then they stay with you than have to replace them every month or every couple of months. We'd rather you do the work once, do it really well, and then from there, you don't have to worry about doing it quite as often. So there's a little bit of extra you know, input at the beginning in terms of time and effort, but later on it's much easier. Right. Um, so a couple things that we really talk a lot about and think are very important. One is that response time. Uh, make sure that you're getting back to people efficiently. And if it's if you're just straight out for a week and it's crazy and you know somebody's sent you an email, just say, you know, I'm really busy. I'll get back to you next week. Um, and then do it. You know, just follow up. Be honest about what you're able to do, what you're not able to, to do. Be really honest with your volunteers about, you know, you have these amazing skills in this one area. I really need somebody in this other area. Right. Is that something you'd be willing to do for a short time? You know, really be right. honest about what you can offer. Um, listen really carefully because sometimes you'll see somebody come in and like, oh, they're a marketing expert. I'm so excited. They have all this training. And they come in and they say, you know, I'm so tired of doing marketing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have done it for 40 years and I don't ever want to see another flyer. Um, then you really have to listen to what they're saying and say, you know, I totally respect that. Let's find you something different that you're excited about. Right, and so as Lindsay's given that overview, it's really designed to help you understand why we, some of you who are already familiar with volunteering might say, okay, I, I know that already. <laughs> well, that's good if you know it already because that means you're doing something right, but now let's take it a little further. But also for those of you are, who are not familiar with many of you being uh, resource development people and executive directors and whatnot, a lot of you don't think the way a volunteer coordinator would think because your priority is not volunteering. So helping you to understand why it's a priority for the organization, even though it may not be your priority as your job. And so that's part of the reason why we wanted to give you that overview as well as dig a little bit deeper in today. And so we want to let you know that we are not afraid of questions, so if you have one, feel free to raise your hand. If we know that it's something that we'll cover throughout the rest of the presentation, we'll ask you to defer until a little bit later and we'll bring, bring you back to it at that point. Um, yeah, so that's that, <laughs> kind of laying that. And so we actually wanted you all to get together and mm. get a partner, one or two people, and we want you to talk about how your organization already uses Valley Gives, for, uh, volunteers for Valley Gives, or plans to use them for Valley Gives, and also what success will look like for you, not just financially, because a lot of us think about that goal. We want $10,000, we made it, but yet people are never going to come back and volunteer with you again because they had such a bad experience. So you want to balance that out, right? <laughs> <laughs> we want to balance that out. So we want you to think about, yes, thank you, Michael. I forgot he's clicking over there. You've moved along. <laughs> so yeah, so this is what we want you to do. We want you to, just, you can refer to this if you forgot what I just said. If you're like me and you have four kids, you're always forgetting stuff. So if I don't write it down, I don't remember. So if we, we can have just a few minutes for you to do this, and then we'll come back as a group and kind of talk about it. And my one last piece of advice or questions you might think is, um, what goals can you meet while treating volunteers really well? So think about that. Um, and how might you use a modest success to build toward the future, if that's your goal? So, so thinking about, you may already have a goal in mind, but think about how those volunteers play in. So find, find a buddy, and we'll give you a couple of minutes. Great, I think everybody has had great conversation already. That's wonderful. I'm really excited to hear uh, what some folks are doing. Would anyone like to kind of share what their goal is, particularly around volunteers? I will pick on you. Oh, yes. I learned is that um, <laughs> is that um, we're trying to do a new part of our ministry, which is open a matern um, open a guest home for moms on the streets. Um, and there are um, other organizations out there that do have that right now, but a lot of them are um, maybe um, um, how do I want to say? We just want to open it for maybe two or three girls. Mm -hmm. The other ones in the area are bigger, and they're already handling situations that we 
don't feel we could handle. They're more medical, medical things, things like that. So we would just want to make it a simple thing where if there was a mom, you know, threatening to be on the street or on the street, we could help her out and help her through her pregnancy. That's a new part of our ministry. So one of the ways we're hoping Valley Gives is going to help us is that um, by advertising, it, you know, doing the little website on the Valley Gives, we're going to add that to it. And then hopefully it'll bring people in for that aspect of our ministry. Great. That's not our ministry. We're also hoping to raise some funds for the ministry we already have going. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a multiple thing for us. Great. Okay. Hi, I'm with Pioneer Valley Symphony. And we have a huge volunteer organization, but they're volunteers because they play in the orchestra, <laughs> not because they do anything much else except right. for our board. And for specifically for Valley Gives, what I'm hoping to do is try and engage more of our people in that part of volunteering, mm -hmm. maybe by help, uh, getting them to be, do peer fundraising and also you know, just to institutionalize it a little bit more. The first year we did get Valley Gives, it was entirely run by volunteers. So those two people <laughs> will help, but we want to get a few more involved. <laughs> so that's us. Well, it doesn't matter how many, they're a volunteer, right? Yeah, that's so, fantastic. And, and sometimes, and what you'll find as we talk about the organizational assessments and volunteer assessments, is that you don't really need a lot of volunteers. Sometimes we have this image in our head that we need 50 people to come get whatever done and you maybe you need three people or four people so it's about really looking at what it is that your need is and really strategically now trying to create a balance to make sure that what you need is really what you need so that you're creating a meaningful experience for the volunteer but also getting what you need out of that situation so uh, before you launch in can I ask one more question just to follow up from that ahead. are other folks looking at some peer-to-peer -peer giving and using their volunteers to encourage yeah I had a feeling we'd have a lot of of that um, so we'll talk a lot more about that as we go along so let's talk you. about the last thing that we asked about what does success look like for your organization does anybody want to talk about that piece did anyone get to that where you said oh this is what it would look like for us if it was successful yes Coming. <laughs> I'm Sarah and I'm with Girls Inc and it sort of goes back to your last question um, we have a goal for how many giving pages we want created so it it answers both questions but we're hoping to use volunteers to create 20 new giving pages Wonderful. So like did that. anyone say to themselves, if we have XYZ number, then we will feel like it was successful? Mm. Wonderful. That is great. <laughs> Yay, give yourself a hand. <laughs> really, you should, because a lot of organizations immediately, they think money, bottom line, and the blessing with nonprofits is that we don't always look at it that way as successful already. So we're automatically a little bit ahead of the game just because we understand that it's not always about the bottom line. So knowing that that always is relative to uh, volunteer engagement as well is very important. So I am so happy to know that everyone in this room, except anybody who didn't want to raise their hand and they really felt that way and didn't want to be the only one. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm really happy to see that you get that because that really gives us a nice level playing field as we talk about uh, strategic volunteering. So as you see, strategic planning, there is no magic. A lot of times people say, oh, they got, United Way got 1,100 people to come out for day of caring. Oh, they're doing such a great job, I can do that. No, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of planning, it takes a lot of strategy to be able to do that. And, and oftentimes, what we'll do as a United Way is when we have organizations like yourself that wanna do those things and they're not sure, they'll call me. And they'll say, Latonia, you know, I really wanna do this. Do you have any suggestions? Do you have any connections for me? Uh, because we're a resource as well as helping people get volunteers physically. We're also a resource for capacity building and also helping them to figure out what will work for them and what may not work. Or who the players might be in their field that they are, don't know about it or they're not aware of, so. We talk about the cycle of volunteer management. And it starts with planning, goes into recruitment and screening, orientation and training, supervision and evaluation, and then recognition of volunteers. And if you do that successfully, the idea is that you will have volunteer retention. So why is that important? Well, it's important because you don't always want to be in the mode of going out and recruiting volunteers. You want to be able to get you a nice pool of volunteers, and because you did everything right up front, 
you have five or six, let's say five or six people that are supportive, that love your organization, they love, I use the United Way and pick on us, they love what United Way does and they wanna be on our board and they wanna be in day of caring and they also wanna be in Valley Gives now because that's what we're doing because they're excited about what we do. And so when you go through that process, you get this pool of people and next thing you know, they're advocating for you. Now you don't have to do the work next year because you have a pool of people that are advocating for you to go out and do that work for you. So now next year you might have 10 or 20 people. The next year you might have 40 or 50 people. So it replicates, but it doesn't require you to be the person now using that effort every single year to figure out how do we strategize. And also just to let you know that we will make sure this PowerPoint is available to everyone in the room. So you can take notes on it as you need to, but also know you will get this information later. So the relevancy of volunteer program capacity building is that there's different points of entry. So you are automatically in touch with people from three different ways, and I kind of use our little theme, give, advocate, volunteer, and it was funny because Lindsay's the one who said it. She's like, I work with the United Way New Ham um, <laughs> Hampshire, New Ham County, Hampshire yeah. County, and she's like, and this is their thing, and they do yeah. this, and I said, oh yeah, we do too. Yeah. So the, the reason why it's important is because you may not call it give, advocate, volunteer, but in essence, that is what it is. Those are your stakeholders. The people that advocate for you, the people that volunteer for you, the people that give to you in some way, shape, or form, whether it be money, clothing, items you need, or their time. Because in essence, volunteers are giving of their time. So they may not have the money if they're 20, 25, they might be in college, but guess what? In 10 years, they'll have a good job and they'll have the money. And if you've invested in them and built a relationship with them, they'll be giving that money to you. Not only that, they'll be given their time, and maybe now their children are coming with them to volunteer for their volunteer for your organization. So now you're building sustainability. So that's why this is important because every person you come in contact with, you are marketing your organization. So when you answer the phone, right, <laughs> and you're rude to somebody, which has happened to me a few times, I'm calling from the United Way to help somebody, and they're like hanging up on my face or keeping me on hold for a long time, and I'm like. Here I am trying to help you. Imagine somebody else who doesn't know anything about you, and if you treat them this way, they're never gonna come back to you. So just from that, you know, just making sure you have the right person at the reception desk, the right person that's uh, you know, com conversing with people and whatnot, those are our points of entry for people and you're marketing your organization. And the other piece I would add about this and why I've found this so useful even outside of the United Way um, is you think about how you might have, you might be an organization that has a lot of volunteers, but none of them are giving. So you think about, okay, now they already have enough investment to give of their time. How do I encourage them? It's really a natural progression. How do I encourage them to now give a little bit of money? And it doesn't have to be a lot. Maybe the goal is we're gonna get, mm -hmm. yeah, we're gonna get 20 people are gonna give something, but the, right now it's just that number of people. But it's helping them to sort of make that jump. Um, or maybe you have a good base of donors, but they're not engaged with your organization in talking about it in the community or in giving their time. Well, how do you then flip that? Okay, I'm really glad that you every year will give a little bit to our annual appeal, but how do I think about getting you in here so you really have a deep understanding of what we're doing? You know, and you really can, can feel why this matters, and then you're gonna advocate. You're gonna talk a lot more about my organization and how great it is. Because that first level is, oh, the United Way, mm -hmm. I know them, they're good. That's mm -hmm. your sort of level one. And level two is, they do all this work, let me tell you about it. And getting them to that level is right. sort of the next goal. So you can bring them in in a bunch of different ways, depending on what your organizational structure looks like now. And then you wanna kinda keep them moving so that they really can become their own spokespeople for right. the organization. Exactly. And so you want to be intentional and professional. I can't stress that enough. Uh, you treat volunteers like unpaid staff. And so there's expectations that you have. When you onboard a staff member, you make sure that they have to fill out an application. You make sure that they have a position description. You make sure you orientate them, you train them. You might take them around to the other staff to see if they're a good fit before they join the organization. And you know, these different boundaries and expectations, policies that you have in place for staff members, you also need to have that for volunteers. There's two reasons. Number one, you're protecting yourself and you're not setting yourself up for somebody who can be a little more than you can handle. <laughs> and, and I think that's probably the nicest way to say it because we've had those experiences as well. Uh, and we've learned from them. 
but also it helps you to, to figure out how does the position align with Valley Gifts. So if you want to have somebody come in and help out with, uh, like Carol was saying, she wanted to have volunteers come in and help out and do a project, that strategy is now you're connecting them. So they've invested in that. So now, not only are they gonna invest their time and tell their family and their friends and whoever else what a great job they did and how much they love the rink, but now they're gonna give their money and they're gonna encourage other people to give as well. So you're finding a way to make people feel like they matter and that, that session we were in last week was great because it, it's about making people feel like they're in a part of what you're doing. So you're pulling them along every step of the way and I know if I come into an organization and they have a position description, a volunteer application, I feel like, oh my goodness, these people know what they're doing. And they're, they're really prepared for me and they, they already know what they want me to do and I won't sit at a desk all day twiddling my thumbs or in a file cabinet somewhere trying to find stuff that nobody really cares about because nobody touched it for five years anyways. And so, and that's what people think about when they're volunteering and if they may not tell you to your face but they'll never come back and you'll be like, oh my goodness, they were so nice. What do we do? You did something. You may not have thought about it at the time, but you know, they always say, what do they say, retrospection or hindsight is always the best? Yeah. Looking back, you can say, oh my goodness, I didn't do that right. Hindsight, it's 2020, yes. yeah. And so, again, you're being intentional and professional. You're using volunteer onboarding and offboarding processes. Why offboarding? Because sometimes people are not a good fit and you were tricked. Yes, you were hoodwinked. <laughs> <laughs> you thought the person was great and, and you realize they never want to go home. They follow everybody around. You, you talk to them a few times and they still find themselves in somebody's office that they shouldn't be in and stuff that they shouldn't be doing because they think they can because they love the organization so much. So sometimes you have to let people go. It sounds like you have experience with this. Latina. I have. <laughs> I have. I have. Um, and I have a great <laughs> phrase I think that's really useful for that letting people go, yes. which I got from a colleague. Um, in Hampshire County, and it's bless and release, which I think is great. You know, sometimes the fit isn't right, and that's okay. I think we often feel like we have to take every volunteer who comes in the door. No, you don't. <laughs> don't do it. If you're operating from a place of desperation, that's not going to go well for anybody. Right. So sometimes it's, you know, this isn't the right fit. But, you know, I think you should call Latonia or call Lindsay and, and we can find it. So you feel free to use us yes. in that case when you get somebody who's not quite it. Feel free to say, you know, I think Latonia's going to have a better fit for you. That's an okay thing to say. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, and, and the other thing is, and, and most organizations should do this anyways, is there's a Corian story process. So, of course, you want to check people's backgrounds and make sure if they're criminal or sex offenders and things of that nature. We don't like to talk about it, but it's a reality that it happens. So those types of things, again, you do with an employee, you should be doing with your volunteers. Um, hold them accountable, just like you do staff members. If they do something that requires disciplinary action, you gotta do it. If there's confidentiality agreements that need to be signed, they should be signing those. And then give them a set schedule. You never wanna set somebody up to say, oh, we want you to come for Valley Gives, but just come whenever you get a chance. No, you say, this is when we need you, or you work out an agreement, a compromise, and say, okay, when can you be here? And if they don't show up, you tell them, look, you said you were gonna be here. You're not here. You gotta have, like Lindsay said, not operating out of desperation. In your head, you might be thinking, oh my God, if they leave, what are we gonna do? But they should never know that. Because when, it, when you react that way, it helps them to feel like they're the ones that are in control and now you're chasing them and you can't do your job because you're chasing them around trying to make sure that they're doing theirs. So again, and also, you want to have an uh, offer and exit interview. So if somebody tells you, well, I'm leaving the organization, I can't volunteer anymore, sit down and talk about why. What was their experience? Um, maybe there's something you could have done better, maybe there isn't, but at least you know what their experience has been. And so, now we want to talk about your organization, and is it ready for volunteers? Because even if you have a volunteer program, you might look at this assessment and say, wow, we still need a lot of work. We still have a lot of areas that we need to focus on. Then again, you might say, wow, we're doing really great. So let us let us share our story with somebody else to help them. And also, just seeing where your gaps are in your organization. Because the, the most important thing that I found is having organizational support from the top down. 
the executive director, the board, everybody has to understand how important volunteers are to your organization because if they don't, there's going to be a disconnect and you might be working with that volunteer and they love you but they have a horrible experience with everyone else. Or sometimes there's a resentment by other employees. So when you have an organization that's majority volunteers and less staff, sometimes the staff feel, and again this is why rules and policies are important, well, they can come whenever they want to come, and they don't do this, and they're supposed to do that, and now I got to do it because they didn't do it. And next thing you know, you have resentment by the staff, and you're thinking the volunteers are there to help, but they're actually making it more difficult on the staff to do their job. So that's why, again, it's important to have that assessment, understand where your gaps are, and also be able to strategize around that. To wait for it to come on. Um, I would also say that that, that level three, for, particularly for some small organizations, those are aspirational goals. <laughs> so those are places you're moving toward, and they may not, may or may not be super realistic for where you are right now. But it's something to be thinking about moving forward, where you might head, um, and things to think about. So maybe you don't get a formal system for collecting volunteer feedback, but you do have sit down with a volunteer and receive that feedback, or you think about different ways you can do that. Um, so I think we'll have, if you want to take a, a minute or two to look at it yourselves and then have a little chat with your neighbors again um, about where you are and where you're headed, and then we'll come back. As we talk about our organizational readiness, right? How many of you have started thinking about tasks for your specific task, not the project itself, but specific tasks that you want people to actually do for Valley Gifts. Okay, give me an idea of one thing that you want volunteers to do. Peer-to-peer -peer fund fundra fundraising. Great. Okay. Social media posting. Branding short videos. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, that's a, that's a good mix of things. It's reasonable. Now the question is. Would you be okay if somebody asked you to do that? Particularly from an organization that you don't always rep already represent. So if you, you know, was going to an organization for the first time and they said, we want you to start talking to your friends about fundraising, would you be okay with that? Yeah, good. It's something, and, and it's not that it's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't, there's not a good or, good or bad answer to that, but the, the reality is we have to make sure that whatever we ask a volunteer to do, it's something that we'd be willing to do ourselves. Uh, so many times we see people call, and I use the receptionist as a perfect volunteer <laughs> opportunity that people always call us for, and uh -huh. we're like, All you actually want somebody to do a job that you don't want to pay for, but you <laughs> want them to do it for free. No. <laughs> It's not going to fly. Labor yeah. law would not be happy with you. <laughs> right. You know, so you have to think about that, you know, because again, it could be something like I always joke and say people filing and stuff, and maybe it's necessary for them to file or do envelopes, and that's okay as long as they understand what the context of it is and that you're willing to sit down and fold some envelopes with them or have a staff member do it with them so that they know it's not like you're giving me the work that nobody wants to do and we're not yeah. important. Because that's what translates in their head, oh, we're not important, they don't care about us, they're just yeah. using us because we're free labor. <laughs> You know, and they are free labor, but they're <laughs> unpaid staff. So when you think of them as unpaid staff, you treat them with a lot more respect Absolutely. and give them a lot better context for why you're asking them to do certain things and why you think they'll be good at doing it. Yeah. So something I would encourage you to think about is a lot of what Latonia is referencing is sort of the old model of volunteering that's still in a lot of people's heads of a volunteer comes in every Tuesday from 9 to noon and sits at the desk and does blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's definitely an older model, and that worked really great for the greatest generation and those folks, but baby boomers and below, very different animals when it comes to volunteering. Mm -hmm. They want purpose, they want projects, they want acknowledgement, not necessarily the luncheon or the little pin, but they want to know that they're making a difference. Right. So it's really, that, that's why this question of would you do it is so important, because it if you would do it, then your volunteers would probably do it. And I think it's particularly useful to think about, would you do it for a different organization that you have fewer ties to or you're just getting ties to? So maybe if you don't have a really strong volunteer base and you're hoping everybody's gonna go out, you're gonna magically acquire some new volunteers and then get them out to do fundraising, 
think about what tools you're giving them. Think about are you giving them enough? Do they really have a sense of the organization? Are they real? Did they have the feeling that they need to go out and do that? Because if it was an organization that you liked, but you didn't know a lot about, and somebody said, well, can you go fundraise for our organization? One, fundraising is a scary word for a lot of volunteers. So think about how you frame that for them and make sure they feel comfortable and like they can do it, that they're being given right. the tools. And we'll talk a, a quite a bit more about that as we go on. And and I like that you said that, because if, if you were, in your mind, saying peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, you might say to them, would you like to talk to your friends about what we do? <laughs> because to them, that doesn't say fundraising. That says we're talking to people about what we do. Yeah. Um, I use this term called ambassadors, and we have this stay in school campaign. I say, would you be an ambassador for us? What does that mean? Just go out and tell people what we do. Tell people about the message. So they have this fancy title for what you know is fundraising or whatever. You have to oftentimes translate it into a language that's not going to be offensive to people, even though, again, we know what the intent is. Mm -hmm. But you have to think, what's going to be welcoming? What's your target? And Liz is gonna, Lindsay is actually going to talk more about that, so I won't get into that. But again, looking at going back to this assessment that we have. So if you're in, if you're a one, you probably are in a very beginning stage of trying to figure out what it is that you even want your volunteer programming to look like. Um, how do you really want to use people? Or maybe you know what you want to do, but you don't have the whole organization on board or the right people on board from the organization. Uh, if you're a two, you're actually right in the middle where you can move right on over to perfection with a little bit of notes and, and tips. And then three, you should be up here talking to other people about what you've done. <laughs> <laughs> and if you feel like you have some three categories or even some two categories, I hope you'll pipe up as we continue on with suggestions, ideas. Uh, because I think peer-to-peer -peer learning is one of the best things that we can do on this ca on this topic. So before we get right into the recruitment, Michael, <laughs> thank you for keeping us on He's track. He's having fun. We're almost there. <laughs> we're, we're on time. We're on schedule, and we're really happy about it. Uh, we just want to make sure, were there any things that stood out from you in this assessment where you said, wow, we're really doing a great job in this, and you want to share a nice story of that? <laughs> Anyone? Or, wow, this is something I really want to work on? We'll take those, too, because there were yeah. a lot more of those folks. Anything in particular that you're hoping to change? Yes? Well, yeah, I saw both, some things. I thought, you know, um, we could change and some things I think that we do now that um, is very helpful to our volunteers. And one is, um, you know, we do, we do try to thank them, and throughout the year there's a lot of different things that we do to um, that we have fun with, and that's important. I think, you know, to, we have a volunteer picnic. Um, we have um, like free coffee every day uh, for the. We have 65 volunteers a week that come in regularly, mm -hmm. and um, some of our volunteers are new. Some have some have been there a long time, and some are you know kind of been with us five six years or seven years, <laughs> and um, so we have kind of a variety of volunteers, but it seems like we do always have new people coming in and that are interested, and um, we're always looking for new volunteers. So um, I think one thing that's very helpful is we had, th this is just for example, we have a program we started called Sew so For Us, and um, what we do is we do baby baskets for each new mom who comes into our ministry. Um, these moms are, basically maybe in a shelter, hotels, like I said, somewhere on the streets. So it's a, it's a very, a group that's very needy. And um, some have been abandoned um, because they got pregnant. So their families said, we don't want anything to do with you. We just put you through col college for a year, spent all this money, and now you're ru you've ruined your life. And um, they, they want to um, continue the pregnancy, so they come to us for services and we help them out. So they don't feel abandoned. They can go on with their life. They don't commit suicide or whatever, you know. So it's a, a ministry that encompasses a lot of different aspects. And one program we started was uh, Sew For Us. And women make quilts for the baskets. There's $500 worth of items in every basket for the new mom. And then we continue helping her till the baby is two. So it, it stretches out and stretches out. <laughs> So we have a lot of different aspects. And then we have a piece of property, so we have to have people for yard work. We do try to put people where they would like to be, but sometimes there is a task where they go, 
oh, I don't know if I can do that. But that's the really task we need done. So, so, we, so we can don't I ask send you? Send them away. Can I ask you a specific question then regarding that? Sure. So when you think about the program and what you need to do as a program, are there certain areas where you look at and say within your organization? We do a wonderful job of the ministry work, but there's some infrastructure things that we need to do better as far as bringing in volunteers or getting them to come back and help us or any gaps like that that you see. Um, yeah, there is, there is gaps, and that's because we took on a piece of property, and right. we need help with that. And um, mostly it's, it's uh, it, so what we, we try to do is just get the word out there more and you know, try to get people in, but we are having problems with that. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing. We appreciate that because the reality is that as you do your programmatic work, um, there's going to be other challenges that present themselves. And Lindsay actually is going to talk a little bit more about the model and digging a little bit deeper into the model to make sure that even as you ex expand your programs or your mission, that you're still maintaining that cycle and that model appropriately as you change. So thank you again for sharing that. Yeah. And thank you to all of you that did comment and participate. We hope you learned something about your organization on that exercise. Yeah. And hopefully that'll be informative as you go forward. And again, remember, if you need help on any of that, some of this infrastructure stuff is hard to change. Um, and we're happy to provide you with some extra resources. And there are more at the end of here. And, and then you've got some also in your packets. And Lindsay, can I just say, it's yes. part of our jobs. Yeah. So <laughs> you, I know a lot of your organizations have small budgets. So don't feel like, oh, we can't have you coming and do a training because we can't afford you. No, that's part of our job. This is what we do. Yeah. So if you need any assistance, we are more than happy to offer assistance to you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's part of our job. That's part of what we do. Yeah, and, we, it's, uh, and it's also fun helping folks. Yes form or a feedback form for exit strategies. Um, okay, we're gonna write it down and we can we definitely We do have get one and we can make yeah, sure that you one. get one. Okay, great, yeah. And there, there are a lot of materials out there and, and one of the last pages of our, our last slides has a lot of different online resources, some of the stuff we're pulling from and also we just have things so if you have a question like that as time goes on after the workshop, Feel free to say, do you have any templates for this? And we'll help you find them. <laughs> it's not a problem. We also can help connect you to other organizations who are doing different parts of this really well, because there are quite a few out there that have some good stuff going on um, and have some great resources. I always think you shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so if we can get you halfway there with a Word document, we'll do it. Great, okay. So we're gonna head into recruitment and placement and talk a bit more about because that's, that's gonna come up. Now, I think a lot of you are already thinking along these lines, which is really positive. You're thinking about starting with people, and Latonia came up with this terminology, vested, connected, and or vetted interest in your organization. So what, we're six weeks out, as we're talking about. It's coming right up. Probably not a lot of time, if you're looking for people to do peer-to-peer -peer fundraising or something like that, it's probably gonna be with people you already have some sort of connection to. Um, depends on the level of formality, how engaged they've been, are they officially a volunteer, do they just kind of like you and follow your Facebook page, you know, what's the level of engagement you have right now, so think about that. But this is a great place to start when you don't have a lot of time and you need some help. Now, if you are doing a project, if you're gonna get people out coming for a number of hours to do something. Um, you know, like we had the example of people coming to help clean up at the rink, that sort of thing. You can actually pull from a different group of volunteers for that project. You can pull from your same existing group of volunteers, um, but you might cast that wider net at that point. Um, so yeah, just think about when you're looking at people you wanna get engaged, particularly if it's just, I want you to talk about our organization on social media and share the link. If that's if it's if your level of engagement is going to be pretty comfortable for people who have a more casual relationship with you, then yeah, go to people who have attended your events. You know, what, whoever you've got sort of in the database, that then you can absolutely go to those folks. But definitely start with those people, and think about how you're going to really make sure that they feel involved and understand what you're getting up to. Um, I had a great example. Our, our funding comes through the Corporation for National Community Service. It's the same funding as AmeriCorps and VISTA, those, those programs, and so it's a federal program. Um, and the executive director, the CEO of our organization once was talking about, you know, 
she's seen folks that have to go and sit and do the mailing and the fundraising mailing. She said the best thing that I saw was the director would then go in and say, you know, really thank you for coming and doing this because without you we couldn't raise the money that allows us to provide all of these services X, Y, and Z. And so it really helped people to feel like, oh, you know, yeah, I'm sitting in a room stuffing envelopes and sticking on stamps, but it's going to translate into this other thing. So making sure people have that feeling. Um, so in terms of casting a wider net, um, there are a lot of different ways you can do that. You can go to the, the next one if you want. I think it has it. Oop, you're trying. It's coming, we think. There it is. Okay, great. Um, Latonia shared her portal where you can list opportunities, free which is commercial. great. Free commercial, there we are. <laughs> it's free, it's great. Um, and there are a couple others out there that you can use, but this is a great one for the area. Um, I also have a newsletter that I run every month. Um, next one will come out beginning of April. So if you're in Hampshire or Franklin counties and want to get a couple people to come help you with something, let me know. I can put it in the newsletter. I have uh, business cards for myself and for our volunteer coordinator, Pat Seacard. Um, so you can always be in touch with either of us on that, in that regard. Um, but think about, you know, connecting people through social media, through traditional media. Um, we actually have had a lot of luck with the Gazette, which I think is cool. Um, who knew? Newspapers. It's still working. Um, so you might think about, uh, contacting, you know, there, there are free sections, a volunteering section, and you can just email newsroom at gazettenet.com with your little listing. If you get it in by Tuesday, it's out by Thursday, it's posted, and we have a program, we have run an exercise program at senior centers, and just by posting that a couple of weeks, we got 18 new volunteer leaders, which was fantastic. So, so we're like, well, let's try it. Let's see what happens. And it was really successful. So you might think about looking at those free opportunities as well, because people do still read the paper. And people with time still read the paper. <laughs> it's a very useful tool um, in that regard. And also, I w um, so the other thing I do want to mention before I go on to the word of mouth piece um, is that if you're interested in looking at how you market to recruit volunteers in particular, um, there's a volunteer coordinators network that meets uh, every quarter and it's meeting at Rockridge Retirement Community which is in Northampton right off 91. Their next meeting is Thursday, April 14th at 10 a.m. Um, and they will be talking specifically about marketing. And I know it's going to be great because Pat in my office, our volunteer coordinator, is leading that discussion. And she has with her a volunteer of ours who is a retired marketing professor, does all my materials, is the most fantastic person in the world. She's great. And so the two of them are going to be leading that discussion. So if you're interested in specifically thinking about marketing two volunteers and four volunteer recruitment and some really great tips and tricks. Um, that would be a fantastic meeting to attend. Um, and Lindsay, and so can I can I add something too? Oh, yes. I'm over here. I'm like, <laughs> you I'm hearing over the there. sound and I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> so locally for the United Way, mm -hmm. we also have a volunteer engagement network. Yep. Um, and so anyone who's in Springfield or surrounding and you're not able to get out to the meetings in Hampshire County, we do meet quarterly as well. And so just for you to know, so they offer trainings, we offer trainings. A lot of times we'll bring Mass Service Alliance down who's the state volunteer commission. They do trainings for us as well. We gather the people and they'll come in and do them. So anytime you're thinking like, oh, there's some things that are really pressing for your organization, again, reach out to us and say, we, we really need some help in this area. Can you get us out of training or could you do one for us or whatever the case may be? And we can definitely work through that. Thank you. Yes. Exactly. So the volunteer coordinators network, which is open to anybody in the area, uh, Thursday, April 14th, 10 a.m., and I think it runs 10 to 11.30, maybe. Um, and that will be at Rock Ridge Retirement Community, which is off exit 22, maybe? Uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, 21? Yeah, one of those. Um, it's in Northampton. It's in Northampton. Um, and they'll be hosting, there'll be coffee, that sort of thing. Um, but I will also have Pat's business cards. You could contact her and say, I'm interested. Um, and she can make sure you stay in the loop and have that information. Uh, it should be a really good resource, though. And also, if you're not able to make it and afterwards want to get in touch with her or me and say, do you have some handouts? We can share those as well. Um, happy to do that. Great. Um, so the last piece in terms of this, this recruitment piece that I really want to talk about is, and I'm, I'm going to 
beat this horse until it is really gone, because um, it's my this is this is my soapbox. This is my life soapbox. Is about word of mouth, um, and this was a great little image that Latonia found. That talks about it says. Um, 59% of Americans believe offline, meaning face-to-face -face or voice-to-voice, -voice, word of mouth is highly credible. Um, and 49% believe online word of mouth is highly credible. So people are getting, you know, that, how do you find things these days? How did I find my doctor? It was on Facebook, you know? <laughs> That's happening so much more now. Do you trust your friends to tell you, yes, this is a great organization? Yes, you know, you're gonna get something out of volunteering here or contributing here. Um, and in, a, in an area that is small, where a lot of people know each other and talk to each other, it's so important that your word of mouth is positive word of mouth. And one of the best ways you can do that is by making sure you have really happy volunteers who, even if they only come to drop something off that they're donating, or they come for a couple hours to an event, go away feeling like, I made a difference, these people are really nice, they really appreciate what I was able to do, you know, they're really honest and forthright, and or I wasn't able to make the connection with this organization, but they were really helpful about me finding something else. So I have a good feeling about them. I might fit you better. You, know, you want to make sure that that conversation that we don't have any direct control over, um, we can't guide that conversation, is, is going to be a positive one. Because um, it really does make a difference. You know, people want that good feeling, and there's so many choices out there. You know, of who they can support. We are a we are a land of many nonprofits. Um, so making sure that people get that really positive, warm, fuzzy feeling when they deal with yours right. is so important. And it's all those little things as we talked about before. It's you know, you put out the good message. And I would also, uh, a word of caution about when you do the recruitment and you do the kind of intense recruitment, we were a little shocked when we got 18 people who wanted to come and be trained for our program. Normally we get six, you know, five. Um, but we figured out a way to get back to everybody, to make sure they were excited, to make sure they were getting in place. You know, so think about what you can handle in terms of a flood of volunteers. And if you get, you know, if you're thinking five and you get 25, you know, think about how you're gonna handle that. Are you gonna say, great, I can find a spot for you? Or are you gonna say, you know, I really appreciate your enthusiasm, here's how you can be supportive right now when I can't handle it in a different way. Um, but be really honest about that. Um, okay, um, you'll know that you have a copy of this tip sheet, the intake techniques for long-term volunteer engagement. Pat and I put this together a couple of years ago for massvolunteers.org. Massvolunteers.org has lots of great resources and these tip sheets are just some of them. Um, and this is, again, this is our soapbox about being really intentional about the process you go through with intake. And I've talked already a little bit about how important it is to take the time on the front end and to really make sure that you're you know, getting people into the right spots, that they're the right fit, that you really know who they are. The other thing that doing a little mini interview with an incoming volunteer does is one, you then know who they are as a person and not just as a number. And they feel known as a person and not just a number because you sat down with them and you said, well, tell me about what you've done before. You know, talk to me about your interests. One of the pet questions Pat always asks, which I love, is now imagine that you are leaving your house to go to your volunteer job and you have a giant smile on your face. Where are you going? What are you doing? It's a great way to get a sense of what people are interested in. Um, you'll also uh, see that you have one of our additional documents is a guide to intake meetings with prospective volunteers. Um, and that's really a step-by-step -step guide, things you might ask, things to do, even things such as be on time, don't talk about yourself too much, <laughs> you know, save your stories for later once you get to know this person. Um, really make it all about them, but there's a, a really good guide in there about how you might go about doing an intake interview like that, or if you have a volunteer coordinator back at the office, you might share that with them. Um, as a great tool. Oop, can you and go back for a minute? And Lindsay, one thing that often happens when you set things up professionally yeah. and intentionally, right? And you do have a volunteer application or I oftentimes get resumes of people and I say, bring your resume with you because I want to find out what you've done and why, you know, whether it might be mm -hmm. a skills base or whatever the interest might be. However, uh, that might work into the conversation. But the other thing I find is people will call you and tell you if they can't come. They will call you and tell you if they found something else. They will be, be very professional with you because you were professional with them. And so setting that stage up and that expectation makes all the difference. Yeah. I mean, really honest about what you can and can't accomplish with them. I and mean, we sometimes, with 600 volunteers and one part-time volunteer coordinator, we have to keep track of hours and that sort of thing. And so somebody will say, well, can you just call and remind me when I need to do it? And 
Pat rolls her eyes internally, and then says, well, you know, I have 600 other volunteers, so it's really hard for me to do. And Oh, and she explains why it's important that this is part of our funding. We have to show what we've done over the course of the year. Oh, yeah, no problem. I can do it. Great. And then they, she helps find other resources. So there are ways to make that work, I think. Um, Okay, so yeah, think about your different types of placements, and it may be that you're doing a kind of a small placement and that really what you're asking them to do is do something at home or do something online. Um, but make sure you've thought about what their skills are, because you may have that volunteer who's really enthusiastic, but is maybe gonna be a little overly enthusiastic and you need to rein them in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Or they maybe are really great one-on-one -on -one with individuals, but you probably shouldn't be putting them on video or, you know, on, you know, asking them to speak or whatever it is. They're really, they have terrible stage fright. You know, think about what's gonna work for those individuals. And if you've gone through and done that intake interview and you've really thought about, learned about who they are, you're gonna know, okay, you need to come over here or you can do this or this will be a great fit. Because we we've had a couple of volunteers who are like, I love to do lots of different things. I'll do filing, I'll do all that, but no phones. Do not make me get on the phone. Like, okay, I wanna respect that, you know? I'm not a big phone person either, I understand. And and. It made me think about the social media thing. So we were, we had a conversation about this, and a lot of times people make the assumption, we need a social media person, and they're looking for some kid who's 22 years old or 18 in college, and then they find out that kid does not understand the context of your organization, so people get the wrong idea of what your organization really does. <laughs> we experienced it ourselves. And so we know that now you look at what the person's skill sets are, mm -hmm and you look at their interests, and you look at their professional background or their schooling to try to get an understanding of what context they can translate things into. Mm -hmm. And maybe have them do a couple things for you ahead of time and, you know, well, what would you do? Or how would you put this? Or how would you market our organization? Have a conversation ahead of time because if you don't set boundaries, people might think all you do is party and clean closets. <laughs> and that's not good because somebody might say, why would I go and volunteer for that organization? Or why would I give my money to that organization? Those people don't work. They don't do anything. But you do. But that person doesn't have the understanding because they're immature in or a lot of ways. The party made for a great photo op, but it yeah. wasn't, you know, it's not the important work of your organization. Yeah. Right. They still don't understand that. So they yeah. need to be trained in that area. Yeah. Right. So just be mindful of that. Yeah. And and one of our best social media people are in the mid fifties and really loves what he does and everything and, and understands everything and able yeah. to put it all together in a way that's very effective. So think about that. Yeah. Don't don't walk in with an assumption. And definitely don't underestimate your older volunteers' comfort with social media. A lot of them are on Facebook. A lot of them are very comfortable with that or can get comfortable fairly quickly. Not everybody, but they'll tell you if they are or aren't, if they're troglodytes, you know. <laughs> It'll be fine. Um, they, they usually will say, oh, no, I don't do that, that, that Internet stuff. You know, okay, cool. <laughs> like, well, then you talk to people, you know. <laughs> will you pick up the phone? Will you see your neighbors? You know, talk to them in that way. That's fine. Finding ways to engage them in that. But I think it's, it's really important to realize that they can be different, you know, at different points. Checking our time here. We're, we're good. Keeping us right on track here. I love it. Um, so I want, we're going to take a few extra minutes before we get to that question. So you can just hang out. Yeah, I know. You've got a trigger figure over there a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's not cooperating. I'm it's, sorry. It's You're okay. Yeah, just let it yeah. hang out for a few minutes. Because um, we really want to talk about this, is that, it, you know, this piece about um, thinking about how you engage your volunteers as ambassadors. Um, Liz, did you want to talk a little bit? at this point about what you've done. We've got somebody in the room who has done well using volunteers for Valley Gives. Um, and I let me give you a microphone so you can talk about it. Hi, my name is Liz. Hi, Gary. How are you? I saw you there. Um, and uh, I have, oh, OK. So I gave you a couple of handouts there. Um, one of them is just says suggestions, and the other one is steps for uh, giving day volunteer recruitment. And I'm sorry that the one that says suggestions is kind of random and just thoughts, because that's really all it is, was some, is a document that I keep on my computer, and when I have an idea, I put it on it. And then I thought, well, I might as well bring it, and I printed it out just before coming and brought it over here. So um, what this information really is, is specific to this particular event. And 
what you really need to do first is to develop a plan. And so some of these ideas are from the plan that we're w working on at the United Way right now for our Valley Gives Day. Some of it is information from an organization that I worked with in the past that, that did this type of promotion. So they're just different things that you can specifically ask a person to do. Because the most important thing with a volunteer for this day is that they have a specific job. So you need to develop the plan and break the jobs down into a bunch of different jobs and then give the specific job to a specific person. I think the most effective thing to do for this particular event is to come up with a calendar. This is a social media event. This is an electronic fundraiser, so it really has to be social media oriented and all of the tasks have to be electronic or really you know, heavy electronic. So um, come up with a calendar, a sharing calendar, come up with a bunch of really cool visuals that you're gonna use on your social media and then get them out via email or via um, personal message, private messaging on Facebook or however to the people that you've identified as being your sharers. So whoever it is, is who's with the band, you've got a great situation, the, the orchestra, you've got a great situation because you've got all of these volunteers who don't really do anything but play an instrument, but if you say to them, and you ask them to do one specific thing, and you say, on April 27th, will you share this on your social media page, or whatever. Can I just say, yep. most of our orchestra and chorus are not on social media. So <laughs> in that particular situation, in that particular situation, because we have board members, we all have board members who might be in that same situation, believe it or not, who aren't on social media, you can ask them and say, look, we're all participating. We're all you know, putting our you know, boots on the ground for this one day event. So what I'd like to do is give you one particular day. And then if you can make it happen somehow through your world, through your connections, through your family, through your friends, here is this thing I'm going to email to you. And would you be willing to help us get it out to someone? Ask your grandson to do it. Ask your son to do it, but get it out. And so what happens is now you've got this month where things are going out maybe twice a day will be your schedule. And you've got a different name plugged into this calendar. And then you print the calendar and you share the calendar with all the people who are on the calendar. So now they see themselves as a tiny little piece of a giant puzzle. And this giant puzzle is now, wow, look how many people are doing this for this one day. And, and it, it builds a plan that's concrete and everyone has just one thing to do because I find that when I ask volunteers to do things, if, they, if I ask them to do one thing for me on one day at a particular time, they're more likely to say yes. If I say, will you help us with Valley Gives, they'll run away. Because it's too big and, and nebulous and they don't know what it means and they think it's scary. But if you give them one specific thing to do, most likely they will say yes. So, um, so those are the ideas, and then, then there's the um, steps for kind of recruiting some people to do that. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you having some useful information. Yes, sir. So I was just going to add one thing in terms of the, ooh, I'm getting coffee. <laughs> so in, in, when we've been talking about Valley Gives, one of the big changes this year as opposed to years past is it's in May. So it's not December when it's cold and dark. It's, you know, hopefully a nice day and a nice sort of season in New England. So one thing to think about in terms of volunteers is that if your organization has more of a comfort zone of, you know, in-person, on land, as opposed to online engagement, that one could do events leading up to it. You know, so there's spots for volunteers where you want to do a table, if there's a fair, you know, that makes sense, that's organic to getting the word out. So ultimately, you're pushing them online, but the engagement is really where your, your organization is comfortable, or maybe it's a push. But there's lots of ways of doing it in person um, to get them there, because the outreach and the engagement is really information sharing and motivating. Where they end up will be online. So I think just thinking broadly about that, taking advantage of that it's not December. You know, people are not overwhelmed with holiday giving and cold weather, that there's actually a little bit more breathing space, literally. Absolutely. Um, and I'd also en encourage you to think about, you know, uh, using volunteers that maybe you're at the point where you just want to get some people, you've, you've got a good team out there, but you need some help in the office. Feel free to think about how you might engage your volunteers on the internal project base 
even thinking some of this stuff up. You know, anytime I'm, I've got something in the sort of marketing surveying realm, I call on my, my volunteer who is gonna lead this workshop with Pat and say, oh, can you help me think about this? And just get her in the office and we talk it through and she does a piece and I do a piece and it's really a great way to engage that volunteer. And so maybe your goal this year is gonna be, you know, on that level is I'm gonna engage one or two skills-based folks who can come in the office and work through this with me or maybe have specific skills about writing that they can write up what the appeal's going to be or some of the little postcards. You know, you've got these great postcards that you can use in person um, or help me think about how I reach, you know, if you're looking to reach an older population that's not very internet savvy, get somebody in who kind of exemplifies that set of your volunteers or your donors and ask them those questions. You know, how, how do you think you could get to your friends? How do you think we could reach your neighbors? You know, um, engage them in different ways. So think about how you can use those folks. So maybe you're looking and you know that you've got this group of volunteers who have done some great stuff, but have you really mined what their extra skill sets might be? Um, and talk to them about other ways that they might be able to support what you're doing. Does everybody understand what we mean <laughs> when we say skills-based volunteering? Good, good point. Yeah. Everyone? No. Okay. No. Because uh, it's very important, as Lindsay was saying earlier, you, sometimes people don't want to do anything that's based on their skills. They only, I don't care what I do, I just don't want to do marketing or I just don't want to do a website. They know you need it, but they just can't wrap their mind around it right now because that's what they do all day at work. Mm -hmm. And so it unfortunately doesn't always measure out, you know, balance yeah. out for us. However, at the end of the day, um, there are still opportunities to figure that piece out and maybe say, well, we know you really don't enjoy doing this, but where are some opportunities or how can you help us so that we could find someone or maybe give us an outline or a way to get it in there where mm -hmm. you still can pick their brains a little? Yeah. And, and maybe they'll say, okay, just this time I'll do it, but next time <laughs> I'm not doing it again, you know? Yeah. So having that conversation, and I think the biggest thing that we don't want to forget is it's a relationship. You have a relationship with them, so talk. Ask questions, sit down, have coffee with them, invite them to a staff meeting where you're talking about Valley Gifts so that they understand what the context of it is. Do you text? Do you send out text messages? Maybe you don't go on, on social media, but you send out text messages. Can you text a few people on that day or do something like that? So having a conversation with people actually kills out all the assumptions because now you know what you're dealing with, you know what the situation is, you know what the barriers are and what the obstacles are. It's like you're reading my mind. Yes. So if, if some of you were on the webinar, this came up, but Sarah from Girls Inc. was, was presenting. I just want to highlight one thing because I still think it's a f great idea. Several people talked about the peer networking, you know, which for most people, most organizations is new. For Revival Gives, we have not done it before. And what was brilliant when uh, Girls Inc. did it for Giving Tuesday was they got their volunteers in the room, committee members and board members in a room, to sort of do some hand-holding training about how you set up an organizational, uh, an individual page and the logistics of doing that and maybe back and forth. And so since some of you are interested in it the, from the skills base, it could be as easy as finding someone either, you know, in your circle who can come with you to a session, you know, and invite your other volunteers who are gonna do it. And all the ask is for that person is, can you help explain how it works and answer questions? So it's a very light lift, but in terms of propelling the other volunteers forward with a level of comfort, it can have a huge bang. Right. That's great. Yeah, just think, uh, we've been talking about how they're unpaid staff. Think about if I have these gaps in my staff, do I find these volunteers who can fill some of those gaps in terms of their skills or their knowledge, and then I can kind of cherry pick those projects that they right. can be assisting with depending on the organization. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you, Liz, for sharing your information. That's great. We appreciate and we've got it. Great knowledge in the room. Um, we'll share a little bit more about that. But I want to kind of go to the next step, now we can go to the next page finally, Michael. I know you've been waiting. Um, I want you to think a little bit about you know, what do you see as your biggest challenges or roadblocks to meeting your goals with volunteers? What's, what's the thing that you're nervous about? What's the thing that you're trying to figure out how to handle? Um, and then how do you maybe need to adjust your plans or your vision of what success looks like? Um, you know, and it may be that you're operating on a plan that the board's put together or your executive director's put together, this is our goal, but how within that, what's, what's your flexibility, what changes can you make? Um, and we'll just spend a couple of minutes thinking and talking about that because then I'd really love to um, hear any things and we can kind of crowdsource some answers for folks. So think about what, what are the things you're worried about, a couple of minutes, talk about it, 
and then we'll come back and share. All right, if we can bring it back. I'm really interested to hear more about what you've been talking about. Maybe some, some folks we haven't heard from yet who want to share with us their questions or concerns, things you're, things you're burning questions or things that you're, you're facing that you're trying to figure out. Yeah, let me bring this over to you. I guess it's uh, just being able to break it down, you know, get through all the ideas that you're getting, which kind of are overwhelming sometimes, and just pick out two or three that really will make the most effective, be most effective, especially with your volunteers, that like you had so many ideas that went around the room, uh, <laughs> making it simple for them right. to help you, to promote the word, to get the word out, or to handle whatever you're asking them to do, like peer fundraising, you know, like that idea about finding an expert, or some expert, kind of expert, <laughs> relative expert to, to say, all I want you to do is just explain to these people and answer their questions, how, if they want to do this, how will they do this? So that they're not saying, well, I'd love to do it, but I have no clue how to do it. You know, so those are the challenges, is that people are well-intentioned people. You've got people that will do whatever you ask them to do, but you got to give them the means to do it. You know, and that's, you know, in a six-week window, you know, how do you get that all going? And yeah. that's why it's important to start before six weeks, <laughs> which is exactly what, what we're trying to, to get over because a lot of times people think of it, and that's why most of you are resource development people because your job is to raise the money, get the money going. And um, so if you're wearing that hat, that's what you're concerned about, which is fine. So now how do you bridge that gap with your other colleagues and now say how do we figure out as a whole getting our board involved or our committees involved, how to make sure that volunteering is a priority in this organization because mm -hmm. it needs to be so that when you have things like this happen, you don't have to f scramble yeah. because you already have a process in place. Now you can just pull from it and use it to funnel in what you need. And I think you actually kind of said almost the answer to some of your questions, which is simple. You know, just keep it simple. Think about breaking it down mm -hmm. into the building blocks, into those small pieces. So something like, I'm going to have somebody explain how to build the giving page. And just that, that's all you need to know how to do, and then this is where you push share. You know, <laughs> Like the, the simple pieces of right. it. But picking, you're right, because we do have a wealth of ideas, and we could go in this direction, and we could go in that direction. Um, but if you're pulling it back to your mission and what your ultimate goal is, and that's why we kept being kind of very goals driven in this, is you got to think about, you know, where am I aiming? What do I want to get out of this? Where do I want to be in mid-May, you know, that I'm not right now? And setting yourself some reasonable goals. Okay, so maybe it's not this mid-May, maybe it's next mid-May is where you're headed, and this year you're just going to build some of those building blocks. Mm -hmm. um, I think we shouldn't feel like we have to reach the super high level. One of the funny things that happened as we were prepping this workshop was Michael was like, I'm going to go find some people who did this well last year, and we'll have them come be on a panel. It's like, great idea, sounds fantastic. And he comes back to us and he said, so here's what I learned. <laughs> Everybody I asked who I heard had done a great job with volunteers said, oh, no, I didn't. I totally didn't. Like, oh, okay, so that's interesting. So, you know, what, what happened there? Is it that they didn't, for real, or did they feel like they were trying to reach this very high mountaintop right. of perfect volunteer management and didn't get there? So, so set your goals in a way that's six weeks realistic, I think, is also important. Um, great, we got another one back here. We have a challenge that is very personal to us, but I'm betting there's others in this room that have the same, which is our annual event is April 5th. <laughs> and we're trying to raise way more in that one day than we're going to raise on Valley Gives Day. So where we did a really good job of getting peer-to-peer -peer fundraising in December for Giving Tuesday, those are the same people that we're asking to be table ambassadors at our event on April 5th. So we don't want to wear them out. So our challenge is reaching out to new people who are just as dedicated to, to our organization as any of the, as our board and committee and table ambassadors, but still being able to reach our goal of having 20 new giving pages. So the timing is not great for us, but I'm guessing that there's other people that have other challenges in July or whatever the <laughs> month is that gets chosen. Absolutely, that makes sense. And it sounds like you set some, a realistic goal around, okay, 20 new giving pages. You're not setting like, a, we have to reach this number or anything, but the engagement is there. And how do we inch those volunteers from this level of engagement to this level of engagement? And then next year, they're here. You know, that, I think that's fantastic. I think we got another one back here. 
try not uh, try not to monopolize the, the mic too much because I have I have like three ideas that are buzzing in my head. The the first of which is I, I want to address that um, uh, on a couple of different levels is that um, so previously I was the community outreach manager for Greater Springfield Habitat for Humanity. Um, one of the events that Habitat does is this really great event called Men Can Cook, which actually takes place on May third, <laughs> Valley Gives Day. And, and what I suggested to the committee is that is an opportunity because what you can do with that is um, for the people who show up at the event, put a table tent on the table with a, a QR code that says, oh, by the way, you're at this really great event and it's Valley Gives Day and if you haven't given yet, here's another opportunity to do that and make it a virtual event. I mean, it's all about Facebook, right? So for those people, and, and by the way, the event is sold out. So for those people who can't show up, if you would have spent $35 going out to dinner that night, make a $35 donation to Habitat via Valley Gives. Um, and I don't want to speak for Jamie, but Jamie and I were just talking about, Jamie works at um, Mercy Hospital, Sisters of Providence, and her employee campaign run, ends the week before Valley Gives, is that right? And what I suggested to Jamie is, use it as an opportunity to extend your employee campaign and say, geez, if you didn't give through our regular appeal, you know, whether it's direct deposit or uh, payroll deduction, give to Valley Gives and support Sisters of Providence. So really great you know, opportunities. Use it as an opportunity. The last thing I just want to share is talking about roadblocks. Our group was talking about um, communication and consistency and branding. And so what do you do with those, I'll call them rogue volunteers who go off, who sort of go off message, right? And so is there a way that you sort of can, cr can control that message when people are setting up their Facebook page? And the example that I used is, Again, I used to work for Habitat for Humanity, and Habitat has this really great three-year strategic plan called 30 and 3. It's all about building 10 new homes, serving 10 new families through a rehabilitation projects and um, another facelift project. And once upon a time, we had a board member who should have been reading from the same script and said, and instead of saying we're building 10 new homes in three years, would say we're building 30 th homes in three years. Okay, so let's go back to educating volunteers and the importance of, you know, you don't want those volunteers out there. So um, you, you do have to be careful in crafting messages for your volunteers and making sure that everybody's reading from the same script. But the point that was made was, at the same time, um, giving is best done on a personal level. So yes, you want to encourage people to personalize when they are sending messages out to people in their Rolodex and their email address um, to allow them that flexibility, but there does need to be some control of message. So I'm so happy that you said that. Two things, um, Lindsay's gonna talk about it because Brendan gave us a really good uh, testimonial about their experience with Facebook. So we'll talk about that in a second. However, to answer your question about messaging, I actually um, had a training that I was in about a year ago and the woman said what she does is gives all of her volunteers, board members, little business cards. And on the business card, it says the mission, it says all the key things she wants them to say when they go out, so they don't have to think about it. And all they have to do is look at the business card, so they don't feel like they're reading a script that's small enough that it could fit in their wallet or their pocketbook, but it gives them the information that they need to say, so don't go past that. <laughs> this is what you need to say. And the other thing is setting up the time to do like a luncheon or a breakfast and, oh, we appreciate our volunteers so much or we appreciate you and anybody that wants to get involved, let's talk, let's do a lunch and learn or a breakfast and learn kind of thing. And you talk about what your tasks need to be, who might want to do that or anybody have any suggestions, does anybody have any ideas? You're inviting them in to the process and in other words, they're now taking this on as their own project as well. So now it's not just Jeff's project, it's not just Latonia's project, but it's our project. Yeah. So now they'll come up with ideas you never thought of. And you're like, wow, that was really good. I'm glad yeah. I asked. Now they're volunteering to do stuff you didn't think about. And they're going to help you because they felt like they were a part of it. Absolutely. Um, so yes, thank you for the reminder. Brendan came up earlier and gave me an awesome story and a reminder about a great way to reach out is if you haven't uh, taken advantage of Facebook ads yet, they're so great. They're cheap. Awesome. Um, so he was telling me they spent 20 bucks to push out a video of the Putnam boys basketball team playing, got thousands of views more than you were used to, and it um, 
and then, then it resulted in 100 plus new likes to their page, so then the next time they posted something, 100 plus people more may, had the potential to see it. So it's a great use, $20, you can specify you know, which group you want to reach, who, where, what towns, very excellent, and it's pretty user friendly. Um, so that's, that's really good bang for your buck on all these levels. Over there, she's coming. So thank you for that tip too, that was a good reminder. And it says you can boost your post. So if you choose boost post, it gives you options and you can spend, it, you choose how much money you want to spend. I think I'm, I'm going to piggyback on that because oh, yeah. I totally agree. I, we just started doing this and I'm thinking I'm putting $20 a month into our budget, which is like nothing. Mm -hmm. And Facebook is the best. There's also ways that you can do things on Facebook and not pay. Um, if you have somebody like for Easter, we had somebody say, okay, we're going to donate 700 pounds of ham. So for every Facebook, new Facebook like you get, we'll donate a pound of ham. So we, we do that on Thanksgiving and usually Easter and we get a thousand new likes within a week. Yeah. It's ridiculous, you know, it's really good. But I wanted to just say the biggest challenge, timing, I, I agree with you guys. Kinda. Wondering if anybody else has trouble with donations in the summer, if they go down, and if um, we find more people are willing to volunteer in the summer. So I don't know mm. if that's something they might consider moving Valley Gives to a summertime. Even though people are on vacation, it would still maybe <laughs> draw <laughs> people in. Every time is a hard time. And you have a season. <laughs> the dream of time off, yeah. So that's definitely a, a further question. We'll see how May 3rd goes this year and, and go from there. But yeah, I think everybody has, it works better for some and, and worse for others. So I think a lot of folks are struggling with the timing because they may have another thing going on. So, I, so that's one of the challenges and I really like, you had some answers. Oh, we've got, Mary Jo has a thought, you wanna head to her? I'm Hold fetching up. today. Yep. At this this Hang is on. my fetching time. Your fetching time, <laughs> yes. Okay, fetch away. Uh, I just wanted to mention um, another sort of um, way to help your volunteers sort of prepare and actually help your organization is um, Facebook actually rewards you the more the more activity you have outside your posts on your page. Like if you have people commenting and you have people sharing, Facebook actually rewards you by um, then showing your posts to more people. Right. And their Facebook's constantly changing. I managed a Facebook page for an organization for several years. Um, so you can ask your volunteers to, you know, make sure to like and comment and share those posts throughout the year so that they become accustomed to, you know, visiting your page. So it's not just for really reaching new people, but it's also sort of building that community throughout the year so that your Facebook page is, um, you know, continue, yeah. it continues to be rewarded in their algorithm that mm -hmm. Facebook sets up. So yeah. I just wanted That's to pass great. that on. I love that we've reached the community sharing learning portion of our workshop. It's my favorite part. Everyone's like, I have an idea. So this is fantastic. Um, anybody else have comments on that? We have a few more. Well, can we can we, we come back about? to it in just a second? Mm -hmm. Just because we have two more slides we want to get yep, through, absolutely. and then we can come back to questions. Yeah. And then, for anyone that needs to go, then they are able to. And we'll be happy um, to stick around and answer some more questions. We do that. have a document which we'll you'll find in the presentation. We have a link to it. It's called Potential Barriers. And I know one of the things Julie s talked about was timing and everything. There's actually some solutions to potential barriers that people have when trying to engage volunteers. So things like timing and you know, not having enough time, not having enough people on board and all of that. You don't have it yet because I didn't want to overload and kill trees, but, um, but you can access it electronically. So, and, and again, we'll show you where that is on a slide. So the next thing that we want to talk about really quickly is just a reminder that, next slide. <laughs> is that remember it's a relationship and the reason why I say that Lindsay and I were talking and we said you know it's almost like you go on a date right I don't know what that's like because I've been married for 15 years but I remember you know you go on a date you got this all planned out and then what if you show up to a date and the person doesn't show up they don't call you they don't say anything or what if they send somebody else in their place because they didn't feel like showing up 
Or what if they just send you a text and say, sorry, I'm not coming, but you're already there waiting for them to show up. So these are the kind of things that volunteers go through. So no, they're not meeting you at a place for lunch, but when they make a commitment to your organization, the expectancy is that you're going to follow through. And the same thing, you feel that way as well if your volunteers come into your relationship. So we wanna make sure that we're doing things like calling people back. We wanna make sure we're doing things like setting up ourselves to build this relationship with another person and, and understanding that the relationship that they're building is not necessarily with us as, as an individual, but with the organization. But we're that liaison for the organization. We're the ones that help them to represent the organization, represent the mission of the organization. So we wanna make sure even down to the littlest things that we are constantly showing appreciation, recognizing the work that our volunteers are doing, and also thinking to ourselves, is this something I would do? How would I feel if someone did that to me? I might have a bad day, but it's not for me to come in and yell at my volunteer that day because they're not moving fast enough for me or whatever. You know, we have, it happens, and I, I, I have so many stories that are good and bad, unfortunately, and I'm sure Lindsay does too. And so, I mean, when we get to the point where we have volunteers for day of caring and you have 1,100, 1,200 people volunteering on one day, I can't tell you the number of crazy stories. We've actually had people fighting at projects because they wanted the project and they, they always sign up for that project and somebody else took the project and now they go there and they're ready to blow, I mean, fight for real physically. And so <laughs> the, the organization's like, okay, we'll figure something else out. We'll give you something to do. I mean, it, it can be crazy with volunteers because they do get a commitment to, to to what you're doing and they can take things very personal so we want to think about those types of things as we're building relationships and with people. I had one thought about when you're recognizing <laughs> folks uh, build that into what your plans are in terms of what you can re reasonably accomplish in terms of recognizing because yeah if you've got 11,000 people how are you going to acknowledge them or 1,100 people how are you going to acknowledge them are you going to do you know 20 people um, with our 600 we actually send out birthday cards we buy the, you know, not, not expensive birthday cards, but we send out birthday cards every year. And for our volunteers, some of them call back and say, you know, this is the only birthday card I got, and it really meant a lot to me. Like, what a nice thing to do, because a lot of people don't send cards anymore. So it doesn't end up costing us more than 50 cents a person per year, mm -hmm. you know, because we bought these, you know, we, we order our cards in bulk. And if it's somebody we know personally, we write them a little note or say thank you. But it's just, it's little things like that can be so meaningful. So think about what, you, what capacity you as a staff have to acknowledge the contributions of the folks who have just done something for you, whatever it may be. And make sure you've built that into your time. And I know everyone mm -hmm. probably May 4th will be like, vacation, break. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but make sure you've thought about, OK, then what am I sending out? What am I telling people? How am I acknowledging them? Um, I work with a great organization that um, when they have people come in in bulk to do like a mailing or something like that, they'll send out even just a really nice email afterwards saying, this is how much we got done. This is how many people it's going to get to. And you know, you make my job so much easier and so delightful because you're so great. And it's just really heartfelt and thoughtful. And it probably took that volunteer coordinator you know, five minutes to get that out. But it does make a difference. So, so just build that into your planning. Yes. So you just made me think about, in terms of the May 4th part, I mean, I know I'm going to think that I'm May 4th, but um, <laughs> if people are volunteering leading up to Valley Gives Day, their gig might be over the week before. You know, so if you can actually thank them, so if they did something on April 15th and you thank them the following week, they might give to you because they got thanked and have a warm fuzzy or tell people when you ask them to send out, you know, an email link. So it isn't just that everyone should plan the thanking after the day. Right, and, and we're, we're oh doing something where at the time that people give, we're telling them thank you. Like we're trying to be mindful of that kind of stuff. But what I wanted to say is you mm -hmm. talked about the thank yous. You can be very creative with it. Um, just like what Julie said about their creativity and how to, they can get likes. Use social media to your advantage, it's free. So maybe you have them do little videos and what we do during Day of Caring is we have them do the hashtag or whatever, go onto our Facebook page, take pictures of themselves and share it with their friends and family. Oh, I'm volunteering, great, yeah, and they're all excited. 
But also, it, it they, we'll send out a video, which we're looking at doing this year, is really making it more of a universal type of video where we send out and say thank you. Show pictures mm -hmm. of the people that are involved and say we really appreciate this. Yeah. The final thing that we do, which, which always works out amazingly, is telling them what the value of their time has been. So mm -hmm. there's something called the Value of Volunteer Service. There's a state one. Um, there's a nationally recognized one. And ours is $27.85 or something now. Yeah, per hour. Per hour. So what we do is we quantify that and we tell them at the end of day of caring because you participated we've been able to leverage three hundred thousand dollars so now they know I've been a part of not only doing something for a local organization but I've contributed this a whole amount of energy yeah. and money that was saved because of what I've and done. If you search online value of volunteer time, it'll pop right up for right. you. It's right there. And they have they do break it down either nationally. And our state average is much higher than the national average, so it's always good to go with that one. If you're not already including that in board reports and all that, make sure you start doing it. Um, it's a wonderful thing, and it's such a great tool right. to acknowledge the volunteers and say, your time is valuable. Let me show you how much. And so this is the last slide, really. Um, <laughs> the reason why we wanted to make sure this was important, because we did talk about the planning and all of that. This slide is nice because it gets a little bit deeper and is far, part of teaching you or talking about what that planning is. So looking at your needs analysis, which is what we did, looking at the organizational assessment. There also is a volunteer assessment, mm -hmm. which you have. And this is something that you actually can go through and look at what your organization is currently doing for volunteers, where you need improvement, and where you're doing well at, and you can actually accent that by doing more and being creative. So the other piece is, again, talking about that screening, that recruitment, the placement, where do you put them, the orientation, training, resourcing, and supervision, making sure you have the capacity that somebody's not sitting there like, what do I do? I don't want to yeah. bother anybody. But they know who that point of contact is that mm -hmm. they can reach out to. Of course, recognition. Yep. But then when you're doing all of these, all of these things, you want to make sure you're evaluating your process. That is the most important thing. You want to look at what your success is. You want to look at where your gaps are. And then you want to make sure that next time you do it, you're eliminating some of those gaps and yeah. you're doing a little bit better with those, those things that you weren't as successful with and you're repeating those things that you're successful at, right? Because yeah. oftentimes we forget what we did well because we did it so well and then the person who was actually doing that is now not with your organization but you didn't realize they were doing that well so this year you failed and you're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> I forgot Susie always does that. Nobody thought about it. Yeah. So having that outline and that plan so that you can then go back and evaluate and what I would your strategy was. I would encourage you to think about engaging a couple volunteers in your evaluation process because they're gonna be able to tell you what was the experience like on the ground? What was the experience like that I was doing this and this is how it turned out. And you might ask them at the time or you might follow up in May or June and say, you know, now that we've had a little time, right. you know, tell me what this was like, what, what tools would have been helpful for you to do this better, you know, all those things and get them engaged so, in that process. You're going to get some good information out of them. Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, we right. do have, uh, as I stated, a needs assessment. Michael, if you can scroll just a couple slides. Yeah. That, yeah. So this is, we're not doing this because <laughs> we're running out of time, but <laughs> final questions. And then this, these are some of the resources that we talked about, some of the websites you can go to. Again, this would be in your presentation. Uh, we'll uh, Mass Volunteers, Energize Inc., they have a wonderful online training. You, it's very inexpensive, like $20 a month or something. And they do webinars and have all of these resources you can get access to. Uh, Points of Light, which is great. They have a big conference that they do every year. Yeah. MSA, who's through Mass Volunteers, the we do a bi Service Alliance. Yes, yeah. we do a biannual conference here locally. And that'll come up next next spring. Right, and so Idealist is good. National and Community Service. In the next slide, Michael. This is these are um, most of the information that's here. You have. A lot of it where the, it might have been lengthier. We didn't put it in. We just put it here. And then we'll also make sure that the information Liz passed out is available electronically as well yeah. so that you can share that with any of your and colleagues. All of these things, the tip sheets and all the attachments are on massvolunteers.org. So if you just go to that page, you'll see the tools and resources section. Click there. You can download. They come. Um, most of them come in both PDF and Word. So if you want to take it and adapt it, you can very easily. Yes. Yeah, we'll make sure we get out to the group afterwards, and Michael can speak to that. Um, we'll get you more materials. Yeah, within the day, um, I think we'll send out an email to everyone here, and I made a list, so it's going to 
include an evaluation just because we, we want to know what you guys think. Um, the PowerPoint, whatever documents that are associated with it. Um, and then we're going to figure out, probably this won't go out tomorrow, but um, within the next week or two, sort of ha if you want to get digital versions of the postcards. But if you're interested, Margaret Everett, right here, who is my, my teammate, if she's got her business cards at the table. So if you want to just grab her card and proactively you know, send her an email and say, I'd like to get this stuff when it's queued up, let me know. Um, but we will get you everything by tomorrow. Um, and then Brandon's doing the video. That might take a little bit longer, but we're going to put that up on the website. The big picture, um, I didn't do, I think, my spiel at the beginning, but what the foundation did is create a capacity building program of which Valley Gives is now a part. And so it's sort of taking that approach of Valley Gives as a way of helping organizations be more effective in fundraising and sort of growing it. So the goal is to really build a repository of information. So in six months, if you, you, know, you start having a volunteer conversation and you say, I went to that training, where can I find that stuff? It's going to live on the website. So the goal is really to grow it. And so we'll get your stuff tomorrow, but ultimately it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for coming and participating. We really appreciate it. We're here to answer more questions for a little while, but we also want to be respectful of your time. It's noon. It's lunchtime. So thanks so much for being here, and I'll hand it back. Thank you. Thank you.